Hey, thanks for being here today. I am here uh, with another episode of Solutions for Self-Funding, and I have a great guest I can't wait to talk to, Mike Vasquez, uh, founder of Opioid Clinical Management. Mike has been in healthcare for a long time, even longer than me. You want to give us a little bit of background on your history in healthcare? Because it's robust. Yeah, I think probably the easiest place to start as we get into the discussion of what opioid clinical management is, um, I actually, coming out of college, uh, we became CEO of the first electronic medical record in the U.S. with integrated AI that went public on NASDAQ. And so we took it public. And then if you can imagine, as electronic medical record, we had 85 installed hospitals and we were the had the most installed clients in the U.S. in 1993. So you can get an idea of how the EMR market has evolved since then. Um, and then so that got me into the AI market and, and spent the last 30 years either building AI systems or being involved in healthcare. And I took a bit of a sidetrack. Uh, we had a family member and his friend uh, get involved in opioids. Uh, the friend passed away, so my wife and I decided that we would get involved and try and help on a small scale uh, with opioid treatment, a drug treatment program. We weren't sure how or where, and all we, it just wasn't. There wasn't any program that we saw where the success was something we felt was we felt we could do better. So at that point, we founded an opioid or a tr drug treatment program, and you fast forward 14 years. And it became one of the largest treatment programs in the U.S. We had 300 patients in residence every day. And we had one of the largest opioid uh, detox centers in the country. The unique story, though, is the fact that 80% of our patients came from California, Florida, and Texas, and we're in Des Moines, Iowa. So not exactly beach country or resort destination. And the reason they came is the way that we broke down the brain chemistry on how opioids attack to attach to receptors and how you can deal with that. And by actually dealing with it at the brain chemistry level, you can give people a reduction in cravings to where they can really start working on, on recovery and rebuilding their life. And if you can't deal with the cravings, it's very difficult because the problem with opioids, as you know, is the fact that most opioid users use opioids to feel normal different than a lot of illicit drugs where I use them for a euphoric effect. And so what happens is because of that, only about 20% of people who need drug treatment actually for opioids actually go and get treatment. They're able to get it, uh, they have it available to them. And, and only because about 50% of those that attend actually are successful in staying sober because they don't deal with reducing those cravings going in. We had um, our program four years after leaving, the data we had, uh, we had 84% of people still alive, sober and working. So we wow. just had data that was, and it was primarily, I think, because of the way we treated you on the front end. That first 10 days was critical, uh, rebalancing the brain chemistry, rebalancing the body. Uh, and from that, however, though, we found that, again, it got a little frustrating because people were coming in and they had ruined their lives. They had ruined their finances. They had ruined their careers. That one thing that was common among all 10,000 people that walked through our front door was the fact that they, in their eyes, you could see the lost hope. And that just was frustrating to me. And so uh, my wife and I decided, you know, maybe we could try to get on the prevention side. What if we could prevent this from happening? What if instead of letting an uncontrolled intersection allow car wrecks all day long, that we could figure out how to manage the traffic so there were no car wrecks. And so we attacked it from that. We sold the treatment program to a behavioral health venture capital rollup out of Nashville in 2018-19, and then started working on that idea of could we build a prevention program so people could be on opioids. And as you know, the intention is that you have a pain diagnosis, and then you're prescribed an opioid to manage that pain until you can return to normal daily living without the opioid. But during that, that period, a lot of people exceed the normal daily living and continue to use that opioid. So what sort of indicators could we have? And after selling the company, we had all the charts, we had hundreds of thousands of data points. And obviously with a passion for healthcare AI, 
that's kind of where the idea of opioid clinical management was born. Wow, you were an early adopter with the AI, and um, that's amazing. I didn't even know it was around, well, yeah. 30 years ago or however long. But to your point also about addressing brain chemistry, um, you guys were doing some really cool stuff, right? IVs, nutrition, and yeah. transcranial magnetic stimulation. I, I, I only really recently heard about TMS, but um, I, I think those are obviously reasons you had so much success rather than you know just CBT and maybe some of the other protocols uh, mm -hmm. most behavioral or, or, or uh, addiction centers use. Yeah, the thing we learned was early, and, and obviously not being a clinician, I decided to surround myself with physicians who really knew what was going on. The first step was I found a group of physicians, a practice, a research practice in California that was working on side effects of chemotherapy so that patients didn't have to suffer the side effects of chemotherapy. Then I approached them with my vision and had them ask them to start working on this challenge of how can we ameliorate the side effects of opioids. And what we, they did was break down the brain chemistry of what's happening. And the simple explanation is the, the body has its own pain relievers, endorphins, which attach to the, the receptors in the brain. And in the, the brilliance of the pharmaceutical industry, the opioid, the Oxycontin molecule exactly mimics the endorphin molecule. So the brain thinks it's actually an endorphin. And when it attaches, it gives you that sense. The problem is, is the, the enzymes in the brain that wash away that, that endorphin don't wash away the oxy molecule, the opioid molecule, so it hangs on. And so obviously, the, as everybody, the normal term is it starts to build tolerance. But the bigger issue that we uncovered is the fact that because it's hanging on, the body says, hey, I have an oversupply of endorphins, so I'm going to go ahead and excrete everything else I have. So next thing, and endorphins, you can't buy an endorphin off the shelf. It's made up of about 30 amino acids, both essential and non-essential amino acids. So what we did was we broke down the chemistry of those amino acids because what was happening was then when the brain or the body felt stress or pain and it called on a need for an endorphin, there weren't any. So how do you satisfy that? You had patients would go into withdrawal. Withdrawal is the body's method of telling you I need to feel normal and I'm going to make you sick until you give me that either endorphin or that opioid. So it, it's nausea, it's insomnia, it's, uh, you know, not uh, anxiety, depression, the list is hundreds and hundreds long. And so we started tracking that, not at the time because we just were charting what was going on with the patient. But as we looked at it in retrospect, we thought, you know, those are the indicators because we reverse engineered the progression towards addiction look just like as you're coming off of addiction. So as I come off, I'm withdrawing and the withdrawal symptoms are identical as you're coming on. So what's that mean? So let's say your next door neighbor blows their knee out playing flag football this weekend. And so they get prescribed an opioid and they get home and they're doing this. And the first week, the body starts to heal just by the miracle of you know, the human body. So what happens is most people in a health plan become very inconsistent in taking their opioid. I get up this morning, my knee's not hurting too bad, I'll skip it. I get to work and I'm busy, so I forget it again. Then I get to work, I get home tonight, I'm chasing the pain, but also at the same time, that twang of anxiety alleviates. So next thing you know, the next day I duplicate it, the next day I, I duplicate it. What happens is then it, in a small percentage of patients, which ends up being a high dollar portion of a health plan, you actually see opioids starting to impact a health plan unintentionally because there was no intention by the provider, the doctor, the prescriber, and you definitely didn't have the intention of starting to put yourself on a path of dependency. But by tracking the, but the illnesses right. were serious enough that you'd use your health plan to deal with them. 30% of every member and everybody listening's health plan who's prescribed an opioid will actually suffer a withdrawal symptom severe enough, they'll seek out individual medical care. There will be a claim on the health plan, but yet our, what our algorithm does is it identifies medical conditions that don't start until after the first opioid's prescribed. So then knowing what those medical conditions are that meet the, the modeling, the criteria of an opioid 
withdrawal symptom, we then can model who those patients are. They're on the progress, they're progressing towards addiction dependency. And we aren't looking for the patient because they're already on that path. But who we're looking for is who's the provider. So we don't need any patient health information. There's no HIPAA issues because what we do is we segregate those patients that meet that criteria and then scrape the, phys the prescribing physician's NPI number and then build a work list out of that NPI number because we know if those physicians were following the 2016 CDC guidelines for prescribing and there was an update, I think, in 21, um, that those patients wouldn't show up. And so at that point, we knew there was an opportunity for at least that small subset to improve on how they were delivering care. So that was really the heart of where we found it and got started. What are those medical conditions you're identifying that are associated? So they were that list of withdrawal symptoms that we talked about. So next thing okay. you know, you have a patient who is going in and can't sleep. They've had sleep studies, but funny enough, the sleep studies didn't start till after the first opioid. Ah. And so, you know, good anxiety, you know, you're on, um, you, you know, you're, you're on an anxiety med, but it didn't start until after the opioid started. So then we can track down and find that it wasn't related to anxiety. It wasn't a clinical anxiety. It was a withdrawal symptom anxiety. And that's kind of how our physicians started to segregate those conditions. And we just built those into the algorithm by, and that's where we had to invent software because that's, it, it's very difficult to put a, because, because there's almost a hundred different opioids, um, different NDC numbers, different dosages, different deliveries, different packaging. And every time one of those changed, the NDC number stopped and it had a new NDC number. So to be able to link that you, what opioid, opioid you were on and then be able to standardize it by MMEs, the morphine equivalents, it was very difficult to be able to make a claim. And so we had to figure out how to do that. That's really where the secret sauce came in is we not only could, could figure out how to link those claims together as different as they wanted to be, but then also standardize them one against the other by converting them to a morphine equivalent. So that was really the heart of what we said. Now doing that, you're, you meet the criteria. So let's look deeper and who's the doctor that's letting this happen. And that doctor then becomes the target. And we approach them to start to change how they deliver care. You're never going to ask a physician to change how they practice medicine. But we reach out, ask them how to do, how to change and add to how they deliver care. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That's great. And to your point, like I'm sure these symptoms that you're identifying, they're not going back to the opioid prescribing doc. They're probably going to primary care, being referred to the sleep clinic. And so there's a lot of miscommunication and missed opportunities unless they really get into the medication history to find out where this started or who prescribed it and how's it related. I mean, I practiced in a pain clinic for years and we had the PDMP here in Colorado. And so those physicians were able to like look up who, was, who else was prescribing, but there was a lot of missed communication in you know, those next steps where people were progressing with addictive sort of symptoms um, or withdrawal related symptoms. Yeah, that's one of the shortcomings of the PDMP. Now, obviously, it's a great effort, great cause. But the problem is the PDMP only measures prescribing of controlled substances. But if you think about these withdrawal symptoms, they're not, you know, it's an ambient. It's, a, you know, it's something other than a controlled substance. And that's how we identify withdrawal symptoms. And so the PDMP doesn't do anything for you there because it's actually measuring how many people out there are on the track are addicted, dependent, and uh, drug seeking. And so that's where we knew that wasn't the answer. And so we needed something that moved way down. And so what we found was, I've talked about withdrawal symptoms, which are the, the is the body screaming out for an opioid, different than pharmacy benefit managers, third-party administrators, who do a fabulous job of tracking addiction indicators. And addiction indicators are indicators where the patient is pursuing an opioid with total disregard for consequences, meaning I'm going to doctor shop and if I get in trouble, I don't care. I'm going to go to multiple pharmacies and I know I could get discontinued, but I don't care. I'm going to go in and try and get an early refill, but 
but I know that that's a problem, but I'm still going to do it because I, I'm at that point where I'll pursue that opioid with total disregard of consequences. And PBMs and TPAs do a fabulous job of tracking those sort of data elements. The problem is, is the horse has already left the bar. You're already dependent. You're already addicted. And there's they're doing nothing for prevention. And so those systems probably still need to be there. We don't do anything better than anybody else out there. We do completely something different. And it's because there is nobody else out there doing this. And so not only do we have a risk management, risk exposure impact, we have a pretty large financial impact for the self-insured employer because of the fact that we're eliminating healthcare encounters around those withdrawal symptoms. And, and we found on average, that, and we have research that supports this, the average withdrawal symptom will be, we can find it five months before a PBM can find the first addiction indicator. So you're gonna be nauseated five months before you're gonna go doctor shop, to give you an example. And yeah. so in that period, in that five month period, the average patient in the US incurs $14,810 in unnecessary costs. Costs because of going to the doctor for that nausea, costs for those sleep studies, on and on and on. So the nice part is, we're able to provide self-insured health plans a full audit trail because though we don't know the, the patient's name or their ID, we can hand the blinded patient ID back to the customer or the broker and they can fully audit every patient that we're saying, this patient's what's at is adding to your cost unnecessarily. So that's really the gist of the model that we talk to, to brokers about is the fact that they can use this not only to reduce the risk profile, but to reduce costs dramatically. Um, we have a 12,000 member school union school district uh, in central Florida. We reduced opioid prescribing, unnecessary opioid prescribing 75%. We had 98% of the doctors accept the changes to delivery of care that we went to them with. And the health plan saved $1.3 million in hard medical claim dollars. So our average client saves anywhere from three to 6% of hard medical claims um, because of that's how much opioids are impacting them behind the scenes. But until we came about, nobody was able to ever track that. Wow, that's a big, that's a big number. Uh, and what, what do you think um, two, 3% of a plan are using opioids, you know, starting out appropriately and then derailing? What, what what percent of a plan do you think are using opioids or, or, or have members on opioids? Do you know? Here's the metric that a broker could use to kind of get that idea. So on average, a plan, take the, all the belly buttons in a plan, and about half of those people will have some type of prescription, any kind of prescription. Right. And 30% of those patients will be prescribed an opioid. So if you have a thousand member plan, 500 will be prescribed some type of prescription and 150 of those will be an opioid prescription. So of the five of the thousand member plan, 150, so 15% will be um, will be prescribed an opioid. Of those 150, 20% will actually evolve to being identified by our algorithm. So 30 of those 150, but the interesting part is those 30 people will be responsible to three to 5% of your total healthcare spend. So it's, yeah. it's it, the numbers are by fixing a small portion of provider delivery and impacting those numbers, you can have a dramatic impact, not only on the health wellness of your members of the plan, but obviously costs. Yeah. And you're not changing physician practice of medicine what how are you helping them what are you what are you doing with them to get them to do something better for lack so, of a better word? yeah no that's in so a lot of states have passed laws but we, they use the 2016 cdc guidelines as an outline so for example here in iowa virginia several other states you have to by law have an opioid contract in place so what we learned in the, our opioid treatment program is you and I, you're coming in to refill your script. And I'm going to obviously, being a caring provider, going to describe, describe to you the risks and the potential uh, you know, 
things that could happen if you continue on this opioid. And I really, you know, I really want you to know that. But what we learned inside of the opioid detox center is that goes in one ear and out the other. Yeah. However, if I put it in writing and put it on the table in front of you, go through these elements of risk, and then you have to sign it. And the provider's going to sign it. It's going to go in your patient chart for your employer health plan. 50% of people won't renew their opioid script. So what we, we call those barriers to entry, which get, or excuse me, a brief intervention. And those brief interventions are that point where you'll sit back based on information provided and contemplate, do I really need this opioid? And could I get by with ibuprofen and physical therapy? And at that point, you're, you're early enough in the process. You're not dependent. You're not drug seeking. You're really just trying to manage the pain. And, and your idea is, you know, the pain's gotten a lot lighter and I think I can probably get by. So there are 10 different yeah. brief interventions that we show the physicians how we inter introduce it to their practice. So these aren't things where they have to learn how to do cognitive behavior therapy. They don't have to learn how to do brief interventions. They just have to push a contract in front of the patient which is doing what they were doing anyway, probably describing the risks, but it's also part of CDC guidelines. It's part of most pain management societies. It's part of several states' administrative laws. So we're just bringing them into conformance with something they they should do. And more importantly, you know that's all great, and they'll you know they'll hear that, but they get better patient outcomes, which really starts to ring with them because I truly believe most physicians just want better patient outcomes, and if we can show how to do that non-intrusively, you know, 95% of the physicians in our full network actually adopt and embrace the changes to delivery of care that we suggest. Yeah, that's great. Now, are you um, talking to mostly primary care or are they, are they pain trained docs? Who's, who are you talking to mostly? I'm just curious. Yeah, if you had to segregate, I would say family practice, general practitioners, internal medicine, because they haven't been trained. Yeah. Right. Pain because a lot of the pain management docs we find are doing all of those things I yeah. just described. Right. And so, but that's a big piece of a delivery network of a provider network. And so when you have those few patients who are going to those few docs, it's amazing how the costs start to add up for a health plan. And so, because we're talking about risks, obviously, the cost from a broker's aspect, I know in the case of when the broker went in with us to renew um, that health plan I mentioned before we came on that was at 23 million when we went live at total medical claims. And it, at our first year renewal, they were at 21 million. They went down 9.2% in total medical spend. And we were the only thing that changed in their health plan. Now, they didn't give us full credit for that. But the point is, is that we were pretty key in reducing those expenses of that exposure. And then obviously at the same time, impacting health wellness, because a lot of employers don't think about it, but these patients that we're talking about call into work sick two times more often than somebody who's not on opioids. They're late to work three times more often. They have four times more worksite accidents. And the big one is they're five times more likely to file a work comp claim. So you're impacting health wellness. You're impacting, obviously, performance that, you know, I mean, what I just described is, I think, the essence of absenteeism and presenteeism, and at the same time, direct costs for the employer for a health plan. So there's there's really um, a point where an employer and a broker need to look at this and say, why wouldn't I do this? What, you know, what's the barrier? Right. And so you work with advisors who then bring this in um, and then how does the data get connected? You have a data file feed that you're going through on a regular basis? There are 11 fields in a paid pharmaceutical claim that we ask for. None of them have any patient health information. So there's no HIPAA issues at all. And so we ask for that blinded. So they do a crosswalk, they make up a patient ID, and then they put it on their site in their records. And then we, they hand us that data, either through a data warehouse or through a direct connect every 90 days. And that's how we monitor, as long as you're a client, we have clients now that you know, we've had for four years that every 90 days, we give the client an update report on how their network's improving and what the impact is to their, their patients and obviously the dollars. And so we've never had a client not renew. 
So obviously the things we're showing them are being proved out on the backside. Uh, so that's really the, the heart of it is get, getting to that point where what we do, the clients, as I had said earlier, are able to, if they can get their TPA to approve paying the claim, we actually file a claim and that's how the client pays for it. So mm -hmm. obviously to be prescribed an opioid, you have to have a pain diagnosis. We have a national provider ID number as a pain management company. So we're able to file, file a pain management claim against that, that patient. And then the TPA just has to have the okay to pay that claim. And then that's how we get paid. So the client doesn't have a budget issue. There's, it's not TPA dependent. It's not PBM dependent. And it's not budget cycle dependent. Boy, that's great. You're making it easy, which it should be, because this is a serious problem, as we've realized. I just read yesterday that uh, there's a lot of overdoses with uh, antidepressants, um, which I didn't really realize, but they're largely coupled with people in pain and opioids. And yeah. so that combo is obviously a lethal combination. Um, and so making it easy to help people, you know, is what we we should be doing in healthcare. So I, I love this program. You also have a new book out, The Untold Story of the Opioid Crisis in American Healthcare. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I decided that as we were, were building the company, and there were several things that we'd uncovered that, and we had talked to the highest level people from the government to the biggest PBMs, the largest health systems in the U.S. and nobody was doing this and i felt like to get the story out it might be good to tell the story uh, of how the product came about what's unique about it and what it can do for you and how what's as you read it get an idea that yeah this is different than what i'm doing or there or what i may have and so i decided it might be easier rather than a, a brochure to just put it in a book and tell a little bit of my story on how um, i came to to discovering this um, and then at that point, get it out. And, and at the end of the day, you know, clients are able to use it just from the credibility of, as I showed the book to the re most recent White House drugs are the most recent director of the DEA, uh, as you know, Congressman Patrick Kennedy, who's retired, but actually passed the, uh, the mental health parity act. Um, as I showed it to them, they all saw the difference and all and wanted to endorse and be part, either endorse or be part of, of what we were doing. So that's really what brought the book about. Um, and it's been uh, it, it, it took a year to write. And so I, I think if I knew now what I knew then, I'm not sure I would have done it. So it's a good thing when if you know anybody's out there contemplating writing their first, first book, just jump in and do it, because if you really think about it, it's a, it's a lot of time. Yeah. Right. And where can people find that? Um, it's actually on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Uh, if they want to email me or go on to my author website, there should be a link there to a digital copy. So you can download that. And we're hoping the Audible version, we recorded it. I'm hoping the Audible version is out by the end of this month. Did you record that yourself? You know, it's funny. My wife turned to me this morning and said, you know, you should have recorded the book. I did not. We hired a a professional voice because I just thought it would take too long to read it. Um, but uh -huh. I'm thinking of even maybe rereading it myself just to, to have that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, Mike, you're doing some amazing and very important work. And when I saw this book and, and learned more about what you were doing, I was like, we have to talk. You know, I told you earlier, I was involved in a pain practice where we had four opioid deaths in one quarter, which was shocking to me because it was 2010 and we were just starting to hear about this and the Purdue Pharma rep was in there every week. Uh, the docs were, you know, trying to help people in a pain clinic. I mean, that's what you were doing. And we didn't really know what we know today. So um, hopefully that's unwinding now. And this is certainly another uh, solution to get in front of people before it turns into that sort of a problem. So I think what you're doing is awesome and was glad that you had time today to have this conversation because I think everybody needs to hear about this that's paying for health care and just to help people, you know, not go down that slippery slope that can happen with overdose and addiction. Yeah. And if we've got time, I just want to add one thing that's kind of been lost in the discussion 
is fentanyl. Please. And yeah. what's happened with fentanyl that a lot of employers are thinking, well, you know, the big issue is fentanyl. Opioids are kind of falling by the wayside. What a lot of people don't realize is the way the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the NIH measure fentanyl deaths is they scan the death certificate. And the death certificate says fentanyl because it has its own metabolites. So when they do the pathology, they're able to very clearly show that fentanyl was a cause of death. But it doesn't address the fact that it's a synthetic opioid and you don't just start on fentanyl because it's designed to be prescribed inside of a hospital setting. It's typically something you progress to. So all of these patients I've talked about, if they progress to the worst levels of dependency and addiction, their next step is fentanyl, which obviously doesn't have a good ending at the, at, at the end of the day. And the point is of what we've been describing, being able to improve and reduce the risk profile for your health plan members actually will reduce, at least in the areas where you can control deaths from fentanyl, because we're obviously we're not going to address where it's illegally laced into some other drug. You're not aware, you know, 30% of people who are prescribed an opioid don't even know it's an opioid because there's a hundred different names for opioid prescriptions. And right. so, but if you, if a plan and a prescriber knowingly knows what they're doing and knows that they can make sure you stop to get back to normal daily living without an analgesic support, then that's where they want to be because it will stop the downstream tragedies that happen. And fentanyl is the biggest culprit. And getting upstream. I'm always a fan of getting to root cause and upstream because walking around with Narcan in your pocket is yeah. uh, too little too late. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Well, this has been wonderful. Let me ask you one last question. I'm going to throw you a curveball here. What's what's one thing about Mike Vasquez that we wouldn't find on your LinkedIn profile? Um, you know, this is something you'll find in the very first chapter of my book. And and to give you an idea of, you know, why at this stage of my career would I be doing this? What, you know, kind of what motivates you? Because I I don't need to do this, but I, it's a passion, is yeah. that when I was 14, I came home from school and found my mom over, overdosed in the kitchen on morphine. And wow. she was a nurse. She had fallen down a flight of stairs, broke her back. Being a nurse, she had access to morphine, and it just evolved from there. So I saw the, the you know, in my dad's eyes, what to do. There was no internet back then. And so, you know, you just, and back then it was a mental health issue. It was, wasn't a, a diagnosis. So you were put in a psych ward. And so I saw all that and, and growing up and I thought, you know, right then, not that, that day you make a commitment, but as I had an opportunity to impact this, that came back to me as I want to make sure no other 14 year olds have to deal with this. And I think that's probably the piece that what you wouldn't know on the LinkedIn profile, but it comes out in the first chapter of my book. All right. Well, that's quite a story. Well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Another great uh, uh, Solutions for Self-Funding uh, podcast. Um, uh, we'll wrap it up here. Any last words before we go? I'll let you no, have the last word. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Mark. And if anybody has a, a plan, a client who you know isn't addressing the opioid issue and wants to create a, a benefit, go to our LinkedIn page and reach out to me and and we can show you at least how to do it or at least be the thought leader in this space to your client.